Welcome to uh, another philosophy lecture. In this video, I will try to, um, uh, to do something that no uh, other uh, human being has attempted before. And you shouldn't do this at home. Uh, I'm going to talk about Rene Descartes, David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. Um, obviously, each one of these three philosophers require would require an entire semester, uh, and um, and in fact, even reading a, a couple of pages of, for example, Descartes' work or Hume's work would require a whole semester. But what I want to do is to focus on uh, on a specific uh, uh, line of thought that goes from Descartes, Descartes proposing the idea that, well, there are innate ideas, one of which is the idea of God. And so uh, Descartes is very confident that metaphysics and metaphysical speculation is possible. In fact, Descartes, in the history of philosophy, is known as a rationalist. Rationalists are those who believe that knowledge is possible and can be acquired just based on uh, and through uh, uh, philosophical thinking. On the, on the other side, there are the empiricists, like David Hume, uh, John Locke, and others who uh, argue, as we will see, argue that human beings uh, cannot know anything, really, because knowledge requires something that we cannot have. And, uh, and so uh, any, any claim of knowledge has to be uh, based on uh, observation um, so empirical knowledge, that's the only thing that, that, that is available. And it's not much. It's not to say much, as we will see. And then Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant uh, proposing what is known as the, uh, uh, the um, uh, synthetic a priori. That's a very interesting concept. So, so my point is for this lecture is to... Uh, uh, to show you how these three philosophers are in in a sort of well, they were not contemporaries, of course, but they uh, they are in a we can we can see them as having a conversation, going from Rene Descartes um, to uh, uh, the confidence of Rene Descartes and innate ideas and metaphysical speculation to uh, the skepticism, the brutal skepticism of David Hume, devastating to uh, Immanuel Kant and the hope of Immanuel Kant's philosophy of restoring knowledge and, uh, and, and setting on the map, placing on the map uh, what human beings are, their nature, and um, and a picture of the world uh, that makes sense and it's regulated by certain r rules, by certain universal principles. Okay, but enough chit chat. Let's go. Uh, let, let's let's begin with Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes was a uh, French philosopher. He lived in between. Uh, <clears throat> so he was born in 1596 and he died in 1650. Very short life, too bad, because he was a, a true genius. But just to, uh, to put it in context, think about the dates. Copernicus was born in 1473, died in 1543. Um, he was, uh, Copernicus, a very famous astronomer, right, because he formulated uh, formulated a model of the universe that placed the sun 
at the center. And then we have not a scientist, and some people might, might even say not even a philosopher. We have Martin Luther. Luther was born in 1483, died in 1546. Now, Luther, as you all know, doubts the, uh, the legitimacy of indulgences and really the, um, the, the, the church in general, the authority of the church, the authority of the pope. He argued that uh, our knowledge of God is personal. We don't need a, the clergy or anybody else to tell us about God. Um, discovering Jesus and salvation uh, can be done by faith alone. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do. And then there is uh, Galileo. Galileo, a great man of science. He uh, made uh, important discoveries uh, Rene Descartes, by the way, knew Galileo, though they, uh, they were not, obviously, Galileo was much, much older, but he was aware of Galileo. Galileo's observations were very important because they confirmed uh, um, Copernicanism. He confirmed that by improving uh, the telescope. So uh, Cooper, uh, Galileo, I consider personally Galileo as one of the fathers of modern philosophy. But of course, because he was not a strictly a philosopher, but more a natural scientist, it is Descartes that takes the title, takes the title of the father of modern philosophy. So Descartes had a uh, very interesting project. In addition to uh, being a mathematician uh, and um, the father, the, 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 the creator of the Cartesian coordinate system, um, he um, uh, studied uh, the, circ the blood circulation, uh, he made some contributions on uh, optics, uh, and many other things. But one of the, uh, one of the many things that he did was a work known as the Meditations, originally published in uh, 1641, Meditations on First Philosophy. Now, the Meditations uh, is regarded uh, by all thinkers as a work in, uh, in epistemology, mostly primarily on epistemology because the, uh, what, what Descartes is trying to do there in this book is to, uh, to find a, 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 a ground, a solid ground for uh, knowledge. How do we start doing philosophy? How do we start doing science? How do we start just thinking about reality, about the world, about ourselves. And that's certainly, that is what, uh, what he tries to do in this book. But it is very important for metaphysics for several reasons, as we will see. One of which is that Descartes proposes arguments that try to give a sense to uh, the nature of humanity. Human beings, for Descartes, are rational. They are rational creatures, not by accident, but because of God. Well, that's what he believed. And, um, and human beings uh, are capable of learning things and knowing things, knowing the world, just by using reason. As a matter of fact, Descartes tries to, uh, to overturn Aristotelian science, which was based precisely on the senses. It was very empirical. In the first meditation, 
concerning those things that can be called into doubt. There's a fascinating uh, method that Descartes uses. Descartes realizes that he, um, he knows everything that he knows can be doubted. That's, that's bad for science. That's bad for knowledge. That's bad for everything. At that time in the 1600s, there was no solid and unanimous body of science like there is today. Although many scientists disagree on many, many different things, um, we're, we pretty much have a, a universal body of science where um, if you go to South Africa or Italy or uh, uh, Pakistan, most scientists agree on the scientific method, on what the purpose of science is and what it should do and how it proceeds and many, uh, many different laws um, of nature that have been established throughout the centuries. But back then, there were many competing sciences. And so one of the, uh, the purposes and the goal of Descartes was to uh, find, a, uh, offer a, a method, a scientific method that could ground uh, all the future scientific endeavors. So he uh, realizes that there are many things that we know throughout our, our lives. And at one moment, we are cocksure about them. The next moment, we realize we were wrong. So rather than keep going and trying to fix a broken system, what Descartes proposes is a solution. The solution is to uh, start from zero. Start from zero, and in order to do that, he wants to uh, doubt everything that can be doubted. Everything that we accept as true, everything that we know, we think we know, we have acquired it through uh, our senses. The, um, I mean, anything that you think about it in our society, and science as well. But Descartes noted that our senses are very deceiving. On the other hand, he was fascinated by the, uh, the universality, the objectivity of mathematics, because math is not democratic. It is what it is, and it depends not on uh, our personal opinion or taste. Furthermore, echoing uh, Sextus Empiricus and other skeptic philosophers, we might be in a dream. And how do we know that we are not dreaming now? How do I know that I'm not, I am not dreaming now, Descartes says. Perhaps I am dreaming. And all this that I'm thinking of, the world and philosophy and science and the past even, they're just a dream. So what's reliable? We have to doubt everything. Now think about it, what can be doubt? What do I mean by doubt everything? Well, for example, let's doubt that, let, 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 let me doubt, by, by the way, what I, what I wanted to, uh, to mention is the fact that Descartes is very careful in his uh, method of doubting. He always uses the, the pronoun I because, first of all, he does not want to take for granted that 
The world is a place with uh, uh, inhabited by many things. So I, Descartes, I might be in a dream. And maybe when I wake up, I realize that the world uh, is not inhabited by other people. All the other people are images, were images perhaps, figments of my imagination. But then if you think about it, you can also doubt the fact that there is a world at all. Okay? And so, in other words, imagine that you have a, a basket full of apples. If you want to make sure that all your apples in the basket are good, what you do is you empty out the basket, then you examine one apple at a time, and you put it back in the basket. That's what Descartes is trying to do. Now, in the second meditation, he wants to provide clear and distinct ideas and show that these ideas accurately represent the outside world. So, uh, once Descartes doubts everything and takes everything out of the basket, what happens is that now he, uh, he painted himself into a corner. Because if you want to doubt, you have to uh, doubt the existence of other people, other objects, the world itself, perhaps space, perhaps time even. Maybe time not. I don't know. He actually doesn't say that. I wonder what, he, what Descartes would say about space and time. If we can doubt them. It's an interesting question. Maybe they, they, some philosopher has written about it, I don't know. But in other words, what, what he's trying to do, uh, what, what he has done is to remove all the things that could possibly be uh, doubted. And um, as I said, he painted himself into a corner. But, but then he realizes something important that he has arrived, he has touched rock bottom. He has arrived to a place where uh, he can no longer doubt one fundamental fact about reality. And that is that I think, you see, this all this doubting, all this method that he's implementing, the doubting itself, reveals an important, uh, an important truth, something that is not possibly, cannot possibly be doubted, and that is that he is thinking. In doubting, he is thinking. So suppose that someone like the Matrix or a, an evil genius is trying to deceive me. Perhaps this evil genius, or if you remember the Matrix, in the Matrix, uh, Keanu Reeves, the actor uh, Neo, re, uh, is told that his life is, uh, is an illusion, that in reality human beings uh, live in, uh, in pods, and uh, they are fed information by the machine, by the matrix. So suppose that I am in the matrix. What can I know? Obviously, I can't be sure that there's a world, that I'm living, that I have a body even, that there are, there are, there are pods, that there are matrix. I can't know anything. But one thing that I can know is the fact that I exist. How do I know that I exist? I know because I think. I'm thinking. I'm having um, um, an experience. Okay, 
some cognition. And this is a self-evident truth. Now, you might think, duh, it's uh, obvious, but this is a, a, an immensely important if you think about it. Because think about how many things that you can doubt. You can doubt pretty much anything. That you have a body, that there are computers, that there are people, that people have minds. Uh, you can doubt free will, anything. But isn't it amazing to know that in the world, in this reality, in this universe, there is something that I know for sure. And that is that I exist. A truth that cannot be disputed. It would be impossible even for God to make it such that I think, but I don't exist. As a matter of fact, Descartes in the, in the meditations says something very interesting. He says that it would be possible for God to, uh, to make it such that, to bring about a universe where, uh, uh, say, 2 plus 2 is not 4. Something uh, along those lines. That there's nothing impossible for, for God. Even uh, things like, um, like that, like math. Uh, but I wonder what, what Descartes, again... I, as far as I, I know, I never read anything that talks about this, but perhaps someone has written about it, what Descartes would say about the cogito, that I, the, the famous axiom of, of logic, of reasoning, I think, therefore I am. Is that principle true beyond reasonable doubt? For Descartes it is. Because it's the starting point of knowledge. I know something for, for sure, for certain, that I think therefore I am. Would it be possible then for God to uh, doubt, to, to make it, uh, to bring about a universe in which I think, but at the same time, I am not. I don't exist. Who knows? So, uh, once Descartes finds this truth, he then then tries to uh, discover whether there are other truths about the world. And he's trying to rebuild uh, the world uh, from very carefully, step by step, by proceeding very carefully from this truth that I think therefore I am. But now there's another question. Once he uh, finds that there's something indubitable, namely that he exists because he has a certain um, experience of perception, he's thinking. Now, what kind of uh, thing am I, Descartes says? And he says, well, Right off the bat, I can say that I'm a thinking thing. And what is that? Well, it's something that, as I am doing, doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wills, has desires, refuses, and has mental images and thoughts. Now... There is an, an, a very interesting example um, that, that Descartes gives, the example of the wax, the melted wax. And uh, this uh, example serves to, uh, to confirm the, uh, the notion of Descartes that what I know for sure is that I am a thinking thing. Now, I am not saying that Descartes doesn't believe that we are physical things. He knows that we are physical things. But the important um, discovery 
metaphysical discovery of Descartes that I think he stumbled upon it by accident, by investigating. He says, wait a minute. The only thing that I know for sure is that I am a thinking thing. And what is a thinking thing? Well, it's that thing that has mental images and processes and so on, desires. And, um, and this leads to the conclusion that then myself, I, am not the physical body. In other words, my identity is not my physical body. My identity, my mind, my thinking, my cognitive capacities exist in, uh, in a different realm. Well, perhaps he thinks that it, they exist in this realm, but the point is that my mind, or in other words, my self, is not a physical body, but rather a uh, non-physical, non-extended substance. And so Descartes discovers that the mind is and can exist independently of the physical body. So human beings are extended stuff, but they also are non-physical mental beings. And in order to confirm this, this thought, he uses this uh, curious example of the wax, where he says, um, how do we know things? For example, I know about wax not because of the physical characteristics. And so um, knowledge is it does not require the senses, our physical senses and, uh, and, uh, and physical empirical observation. So what about the wax? The wax uh, is curious because if you take a piece of wax, it has a certain smell and texture and, uh, and, uh, and size and shape. But when you melt the wax, the, the wax by a fire, by heat, all of a sudden the, um, the wax changes completely. It's no longer uh, hard, it's no longer white or opaque, whatever that color is. It's a different smell, different texture, different everything. It's liquid. And yet, I know that it is the same piece of wax. Now think about it, if our knowledge of the external world came from uh, our uh, experience, then we would not know that the melted wax is the same wax. So Descartes uh, concludes that our knowledge of the wax is based on uh, our intellect, our thinking about the wax. So uh, our intellect, our thinking of, rational capacities are what give us the knowledge of the wax, that the melted wax and the, the original piece of wax are the same object. If a substance such, a, such as wax can be known in this fashion, then the same must be for ourselves. So the self, as I was saying before, is not determined by what we sense of ourselves. These hands, this head, these eyes, all the, the objects external 
and other minds, for example. Rather, we know ourselves, I know myself, by simply knowing uh, that I'm thinking. Therefore, one can't grasp anything more easily or plainly than his mind, than my mind. That's the, uh, the thing that I, that I can grasp immediately and I know that is there. Now, what's important about this is that uh, if I can Im even imagine the logical possibility that the mind, that myself, does not require a body, if I can logically see that I can uh, detach myself from my body, then what follows is that, as I said earlier, Myself, the person, my identity, is a substance, a mental substance, a non-physical substance. And so uh, the world then, the universe, is such that there are minds, and these minds do not require the body to exist. Now, in a third meditation, obviously Descartes needs something to, uh, to cement his argument, to corroborate his argument, to give force to his argument. And so he needs uh, to... Uh, to show that all this speculation can uh, uh, can be granted by something, and also that that he can uh, move from the corner into which he painted himself. Because think about it: if uh, the only thing that I that I can know is that I exist, then I can't know anything else. Anytime I take a step, any step that I take out of that corner, again, can be doubted. So in order to, uh, to move uh, back and put back the world the way it was and carefully, Descartes wants to prove the existence of God. Because if he proves the existence of God, then since God, by definition, is a loving, all-loving being, then it must be that he created me and he did not deceive me. Now, of course, he did not give me a uh, perfect apparatus because if I were perfect, I would know that I, were per that I was perfect, but I'm not perfect. I'm imperfect. I cannot be God. Only God can be perfect. But, nevertheless, even though God created a us, and we are not perfect like God, we still have the capacity to uh, reason, reason well, and we know that God is not going to deceive us. And so if we use mathematics and reasoning and logic, we can know many things about the world in this way. So one way that he argues for the existence of God is that, first of all, there, there is an innate idea of God in our minds. And it's interesting because we have many ideas. There are lots of ideas. There are ideas of impossible things. For example, the idea of a round square. That's something impossible. That can't be it. There are also ideas of contingent things. Things that don't exist, but, but they might exist. They could exist. For example, unicorns. And then there are ideas of things that are necessary. I listed numbers, but really what Descartes has in mind is God. The idea of God. Now, obviously, the idea of God for, for Descartes is not impossible then it's either contingent or it is necessary. 
But if God exists, obviously, is necessary. But by definition, by the very definition, God must exist. And he proves this with uh, another argument uh, that is known as the ontological argument. The ontological argument, let me actually, right, flip to the next slide. The ontological argument is very interesting. So the first argument says, there are many ideas of things in my mind. As I said, they're impossible ideas, contingent or necessary. Now, where do you get the idea, Descartes says, about God? God, the idea of God is, what is the definition of God? It is a supreme being uh, that, that, that is perfect. But nothing in nature is perfect. Consequently, it must be God that gave me that idea. Okay? Because God is perfect and only God could give me the idea of a perfect being. So the other argument uh, based on, uh, on, the, on this notion of ideas is the following. God is defined as an infinitely perfect being. That's the definition. Now, of course, you can say to Descartes, but why do you define it that way? Descartes would say, well, that's, that's how we define God. If there were a God, wouldn't you think that God would be uh, a perfect being? What does that mean, perfect? Well, perfect means that is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, etc. <clears throat> but then, in the second premise, Descartes says, something cannot be perfect without existence. Right? If I say, I have the perfect uh, uh, phone, the iPhone uh, 13 is the perfect iPhone, okay? But my perfect phone doesn't exist. Well, then it can't be perfect. So, uh, because perfection requires existence, and God is perfect, then God must exist. Well, one might uh, <clears throat> object that using a similar argument I could prove the existence of a perfect cell phone, like I suggested, or a perfect island, or a perfect pizza. I can say I have an idea of a supremely perfect island, or pizza, or phone. Existence is a perfection. Therefore, a supremely perfect island, or pizza, or cell phone exists, right? Well, Descartes says, no, it's wrong. First of all, a perfect island is something that cannot possibly exist. Because what is a perfect island or a perfect phone? If I, I can destroy my phone, consequently it's not perfect. I can uh, launch a, a uh, missile and uh, blow up an island. It's not going to be perfect. Something perfect means that cannot be perfected, it cannot be improved upon in any way, and it's eternal and it's unchanging. But these things change. So the argument, according to Descartes, works when it, it applies to God, because God, by definition, is a, a perfect being, but an abstract being, unlike an island or a phone. So a phone must be something uh, that exists in, uh, in time and space, something physical. And physical things are subject to change, and therefore they cannot be perfect. But God, by definition, is a perfect being, and uh, uh, 
he is not a uh, physical being. And therefore, the, uh, this argument, the ontological argument uh, based on uh, perfection works with God, but not with other objects. So now, he says, suppose that God does not exist. Then we, we can conceive a being that is more perfect than God, one that exists. And therefore, that will be God. Right? Now, before I, I move on to uh, David Hume, <clears throat> so, what is the, uh, uh, let's try to, to, uh, to state some concluding remarks about Descartes. Descartes is a rationalist. He uh, proposes a method, a method that shows that human beings can acquire knowledge. Knowledge is possible, it is possible and this is demonstrated by the fact that I know that I exist because I think. Next, Descartes offers a uh, metaphysical picture of the world and human beings. Reality is made of extended stuff. I know because God is not a deceiver. And so, uh, very carefully, I can think about it, and I know that there is an external world. God would not deceive me. At the same time, I know that I exist, but my identity, myself, is not a physical object. Why? Because I can think of myself logically, as a separated, as a separate substance, a non-physical substance. And consequently, human beings are, you see, this, this answers a metaphysical question, who am I? What is a human? What is a person? Well, a person is a mental thing. The physical body is the, the vessel, the container of our soul or, or mind. Okay. And we know this because we can think about it. Immediately, when you think, you, uh, you have a perception. You have a perception of yourself. Great. Now... A century later, David Hume wrote an inquiry concerning human understanding. David Hume, in a way, responds to uh, the philosophy of Descartes. And he gives a, an opposite picture of the world and the nature of human beings. First of all, Hume argues that perception may be a, of two kinds. There are thoughts, or what he calls ideas, and also there are impressions, or sensations. So in other words, uh, impressions are what happens when you uh, hear a sound, see something, touch something. That's an impression. And that impression creates in your mind an idea. So the senses, sensations, create ideas. Every sensation corresponds to an idea, and every idea corresponds to a sensation. Like photocopies. Now Hume says that there are no ideas, none, not even one idea there is innate uh, because every idea in my mind is a copy of a, a sensation or an impression. 
This was already uh, discovered by, or argued by, by John Locke, by the way. John Locke says, what could you possibly mean by innate ideas? Well, remember, Descartes says, there are innate ideas. The idea of God, for example. <clears throat> How would you possibly know that there is a God? Unless you had a, an innate idea planted there by God. Hume denies this, just like Locke. If you have an idea, an uh, innate idea of God, how do you know it's innate? After all, every human being starts talking about God when they learn about God. Okay, It's not that they knew it before and they say, oh, I remember, I knew it. And now that I read about God, now I remember. No, you... Uh, you learn about God and you know that idea and you form an idea of God. So, um, no idea can be there in our minds unless there was an experience that generated that idea. So, now, ideas in our minds, according to Hume, can be produced by sensations or they can be produced by a process that combines these ideas. There are certain principles that they follow, talks about it. But in other words, ideas can be complex ideas. They can be uh, uh, connected And um, in no other way we can know the world. There are only these two ways. How do we know that? Hume offers two arguments. The first argument is that you can take any idea as bizarre as you want uh, want as you can imagine. Think about the, uh, the idea of a green um, Martian squirrel eating apple pie on Jupiter. Okay? As bizarre as that idea might seem, it's just an idea made up by other ideas, simpler ideas, each of which corresponds to a sensation, to an experience. Okay. Now remember that, that Descartes, Descartes is convinced that the idea of God cannot be explained in any other way but to say that God himself put the idea of himself into our minds. So we have that innate idea. And Hume responds to that by saying, the idea of God is not innate. It's just the idea of man plus all the attributes that we, uh, we attribute to God. For example, intelligence, power, but we, uh, we have to think about it to uh, the infinite power. And voila, that's how you explain the idea of God. Okay? What about the, uh, the, the example, that, another example that Hume gives is the example of a golden mountain. There's nothing really special about the idea of a golden mountain. It's just the idea of gold and the idea of a mountain. When you put it together, put them together, you get the idea of a golden mountain. And you might think, I never experienced a golden mountain. Therefore, the idea of a golden mountain must be innate. No, it's not innate. It just, uh, it's a complex idea. Okay, gr great. So, another argument is the following. If you don't have 
uh, if you lack one of the senses, for example, you are, you are born a blind or deaf, then it follows necessarily that you are not able to uh, see things or hear things. And consequently, you cannot form an idea of, for example, if you were born blind, there's no possible way that you can form an idea of what red looks like, or blue, or any other color, or any other shape or form. Now, another example, if you uh, if you never tasted a, a certain food, let's say mango, you never had mango before, there's no possible way for you to know, to have an idea in your mind of what it feels like, what it, what it is like, what it tastes like to eat mango. Okay? Consequently, all these ideas in our minds are complex, either complex ideas or there are ideas that come directly from an impression, an experience, a sensory experience. Okay, now, why am I telling you all this? Well, Hume is telling you all this. Well, move it, move it all this to the back burner for a second, okay? Now, let's, let's think of what Hume says about reasoning. Reasoning, according to Hume, is only of two kinds. There are relations of ideas, okay, and there are there are matters of fact. These are the sources of knowledge. But relation of ideas are things like, according to Hume, mathematical equations, math mathematical truths, um, these relations are a priori. In other words, they require no experience. If I know that a triangle has three sides by definition, all triangles, I don't need to look, all triangles will have to be three-sided. I don't need to look, I don't need to experience any other th triangle. So these are discoverable, this truth is discoverable by reason alone. And it's not dependent on my sensory experience. Now, of course, I don't want to jump the gun, but some people might say, well, wait a minute, but the first time they, I learned about triangles, that is a sensory experience, right? Yes, but Hume would say, Granted, you learn it through sensory experience, but, um, but then you know that all triangles have three sides without looking. But that's for later. Anyway. Now, the other way that we learn things is a posteriori. Right? Uh, those are what, what Hume calls matters of fact. So these uh, uh, matters of fact are not discoverable by reason alone, but depend on our sensory experience. For example, if I tell you that I'm wearing black pants, there's no possible way for you to know it. Even if you know everything about my nature, my DNA, down to the last cell of my body, you will never discover that I have black pants and I'm wearing black pants today. That is something that you have to experience, okay? Now, Hume now notice, notices that relations of ideas are not informative. They're not the source of knowledge because they are tautological. Tautological means that they are empty truths. An empty truth is something like A is the same thing as A. X is the same thing as X. Okay. I am identical to myself. 
that our understanding of the world is based on matters of fact rather than uh, uh, than relation of ideas. Relation of ideas are really things that don't tell us anything about the world. For example, 2 plus 2 equals 4. I know this by relating my ideas uh, according to Hume. But reasoning concerning matters of fact, which are which is the reasoning, the type of reasoning that we claim uh, it gives us knowledge of the world, this type of reasoning is based on the relation of cause and effect. Now, the, the relation of cause and effect, the principle of cause and effect, is a principle that says that every event has a cause. Okay? Every event has a cause. If I throw a, a rock in a, in a body of water, that will cause the water to form ripples. Okay? Uh, here's the problem, first problem that Hume points out. How do I know that the principle of cause and effect is true? I can't discover the truth of cause and effect by reason because there is no uh, rational argument that I can form to prove that cause and effect is true. Every effect, every event in the world is distinct from its cause. Well, I mean, from its cause, from what we believe to be the cause. So, for example, my throwing the rock in, in, a, in a pond and the ripples are very distinct events. How do I know that one is the causal factor that brings about the second event? Namely, how do I know that my throwing the rock in a pond is what causes the, the ripples in the pond? Therefore, an effect, what we know, what we think to be an effect, cannot be discovered in a causal object or event merely by a priori reasoning. I don't know by definition okay, that rocks cause ripples in the water. I do know by definition that all triangles have three sides. You see, for example, if I say to you that I have a triangle in my pocket, you don't need to see it. You know that it has three sides. If I say to you, how do you know? How would you know that? You've never seen it before. It's hidden in my pocket. And you say, easy, just by reasoning. Don't need to see it. But how could you possibly prove by the same uh, sort of mental uh, logical reasoning used uh, to, to prove that the triangle in my pocket has three sides, how could you possibly prove by using the same principle, this same principle, that throwing a rock in, into a pond causes ripples in water? You couldn't do that by reasoning. You would have to experience it. You cannot do that prior, prior to experience. So cause and effect relations must ultimately be proven or disproven by experience. Every time I throw a rock, I discover that the ripples come about. I don't know why. I imagine that the rock has something to do with it, but I cannot confirm it by logic, by reasoning. Because any conclusion from experience assumes that the future will conform the past. But even this principle, that the future conforms the past, it's something that I cannot prove. No one can prove that the future is going to resemble the past. 
No one can prove that. Tomorrow, when you uh, eat your bagel, instead of uh, dying, the bagel will nourish you. No one will be able to prove that tomorrow, for example, or in the next five minutes, I throw something in uh, a rock into the pond and ripples will form. How could I possibly prove it? I can show it by doing it, but I can't prove it that that must be the case. So we cannot prove any necessary connections between a cause and a would-be effect. We can only demonstrate that an event and another event may be temporally or spatially contiguous, regular in succession, and constantly conjoined. Even worse, we cannot prove that there is any necessary connection between uh, internal events in the mind. Therefore, remember what Hume, uh, what Descartes says about the nature of human beings. That I am a thinking thing. That I have, I experience all these sensations, these thoughts, these images in my mind. And my mind is not my body, but it, it is a substance independent of my body. But Hume, Hume says, how can Descartes possibly know that? How can Descartes know that there is a self, an I, think, therefore I am? How else would you explain it, Hume? Well, Hume explains it, in, he calls it a bundle of perception. Hume says, look, every time you think about it, every, every time you think, okay, every time you think, what do you see? Do you see a self? No. You will experience either cold, heat, hunger, anger, boredom, and so on. So uh, what happens is that what you really... They, I, it's wrong even, I shouldn't say you. Experience is the way to put it, that Hume would put it. It's not that I experience, but experience is such that there are many different perceptions. By these perceptions, there's no evidence that they are unified into an I, into a self. So we can't even be sure that the self exists. Moreover, one of the, uh, the metaphysical principles is, as I explained it in my lecture on metaphysics, the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of sufficient reason says that every event, everything that exists, including events, including for example, throwing a rock in a pond, okay? Every event must have an explanation or a cause or at least an explanation for its existence, okay? Either in itself or in something else, okay? But um, then when we explore the, the nature of causation, cause and effect, the law of cause and effect, we find that we cannot prove that any event is the effect of some other event. And consequently, the principle of sufficient reason, Hume would say, is false. It is false that every event must have a cause. It seems that, that way, logically, but we can't prove it. There's no reason to believe that every event must have a cause. Because how would you possibly, how could you possibly prove it logically? It can't be done. You can't prove it. For all we know, some events or many events or all events happen for no reason whatsoever. But we don't know that. We think we know. 
but we don't. Even worse, we may try to show that this external world exists independently of our perceptions of the world. However, there is no logical necessity for this conclusion. We can't prove that there is a world. We cannot prove that there, that I exist. So as you can see, David Hume pushes the envelope very, very far. Not even, he doesn't even accept the axiom, uh, the cogito that, that Descartes formulated. I think, therefore I am. Where is the I? Show me the I, Descartes. There is no I. There are no innate ideas. All our ideas, everything that, that you think you have, all the perception is the product of sensations. No reason to believe that there is a unified self. So we're pretty much left with, uh, with a mess, a theater of things that go back and forth that happen in the world, but we, um, we have no uh, reason to believe that there are selves and that we have knowledge of anything. We don't know how things work. No one knows. We have only our sensory perceptions as evidence of whatever happens, whether there is an external world, um, of really anything about the world. So talking about metaphysical principles, Hume says there aren't any, there aren't any principles that we can possibly know. The only things that we know is, is, uh, is that um, we have certain experiences, but we don't know if there is a self that is having these experiences or they're just experiences. Don't know anything. So knowledge is impossible of relation of ideas, even relation of ideas. Um, what about matters of fact or uh, matters of existence? We can know, cannot prove logically with, ne with necessity that anything is true, that anything can be uh, uh, established. So reasoning about matters of fact may be based on previous experience, how they are related to each other, but cannot prove that any relation of cause and effect between matters of fact is logically necessary. All I know is that in the past, in the past, which by the way, the past could, could be a figment of my imagination, but anything in the past that worked a certain way uh, may not work the same way in the future. Consequently, metaphysics is impossible. It's not a science, but it's bogus. It's just a, um, it's just an illusion. Theology, metaphysics, all those scientists that speculate about non-physical objects, the self, the nature of the universe, the laws of the universe, principles of the universe that are universal, such as the principle of sufficient reason or a gravity or any other principle. They can't be but nothing but mere speculation. In other words, everything that we know, that we think we know, is not something that we know with certainty, it is not something that we have reached upon a careful, uh, rational investigation. Rather, Hume suggests, everything that we know is can be a matter of faith or a, even better, habit, habituation. Certain things 
happen with a certain regularity. And, uh, and then the, the mind uh, somehow goes off and uh, creates this illusion that events are connected in a causal way. So what are the implications? Once again, the implications that many aspects of human understanding may not be governed by principles of necessity. Okay? Many aspects, or even all aspects. Okay? So, we like to believe that our understanding, our knowledge is governed and created and generated by uh, certain uh, universal principles, but these principles don't exist. Cause and effect is just an illusion created by our minds in order to make sense of the world. So the human understanding may not be logically necessary. Human understanding may be limited by a lack of necessity and necessary connections between uh, perceptions and reality. There might even be a reality, but we have no idea where reality is, if there is reality, and how it works. All we have is habituation. So, what is the nature of humanity, of human being? What am I? And what is there? These are metaphysical questions. Obviously, what I can know, what can I know, that's a, an epistemological question. But let's focus on the metaphysical questions. What is there? What is the world? What is nature? What is reality? What am I? We, uh, we don't know. There's no possible way, and there's no possible way ever for us to know. Because we are, we have to accept that we are natural beings, just like animals, just like trees, and uh, we have no understanding of necessity. We have no good arguments, no arguments whatsoever to uh, claim that there is necessity in the world. Nothing is necessary. And so uh, this leads to a uh, profound moral and, uh, and logical and, um, and practical skepticism of reality. And uh, again, the, uh, the metaphysical import of all this is that um, there's no reason to believe that we could ever, and in fact there are reasons, to believe that human beings cannot acquire any knowledge of themselves or of the world, any operation of nature. As a matter of fact, as Hume points out, it might turn out that we're not even uh, unified selves and there's just just there exists perception in the world sounds very bizarre sounds so bizarre that Immanuel Kant read David Hume and said whoa he was blown away by Hume in fact he credits Hume in uh, in his writings he says that Hume um, woke him up from a, from a, from a, a dogmatic slumber. He was asleep, and he, in Hume, he he thanks Hume because Hume helped him realize something very important, namely that Hume is wrong. <laughs> well, Hume is right and wrong. Remember, reasoning is of two kinds: relation of ideas and matters of fact. Now, Kant wants to say, renames these two uh, uh, processes of reasoning. He renames it by calling relation of ideas analytic, uh, analytic judgment. 
analytic judgments are always a priori. Remember, how do I know that triangles have three sides prior to experience? How do I know that after the number 100, there is another number prior to experience? Okay. How do I know that after the, uh, the biggest number that I can name, uh, there is a prime number? Again, I cannot possibly experience that. But I know it because prior to experience, because uh, just by relation of ideas, I know that. That after one number, there's another number. Okay? How do I know that a bachelor is an unmarried man? I know it just by, by virtue of meaning. Okay? No experience required. On the other hand, matters of fact is what Kant renames synthetic. And synthetic judgments are done never a priori. Well, not never, actually. But they're done a posteriori. In other words, synthetic judgments are those judgments that I make when I experience things in the world. And so, uh, for example, whether bachelors are happy or whether uh, uh, this soup is too salty, these are judgments that I cannot possibly make based on uh, reason alone. I have to experience it. I have to experience them. I have to uh, have a sensory experience, touch them, taste them, hear them, and so forth. So Hume attacks knowledge at its very, very source, cause and effect. Remember? The reason why we, we have this illusion that, that there is cause and effect is because, because of past experience. But there's no such thing as cause and effect. Or at least we cannot prove it. So a reason altogether is diluted with reference to causation. Reason has no power to penetrate the secrets of reality. We can't do that. And so we cannot have knowledge of reality. Or, or of anything really. Of ourselves even. Remember, for Hume, it is habit that, govern, that governs human beings rather than knowledge of, or necessary knowledge. Now, Kant acknowledges Hume's distinction, as I said, and he renames relations of ideas, matters of fact, as analytic and synthetic. So there is an important distinction, Kant explains, between analytic and synthetic. Analytic judgments are explicative. They add nothing to the content of my cognition. Okay? No uh, no further information to the content of my cognition. If I think about X, and I think that X is X, nothing is added to my cognition. If I think that all objects occupy space, Again, no extension or explanation, nothing is added to uh, my cognition. So, uh, this sort of a uh, judgment is not expansive. It doesn't increase my cognition. 
analytic judgments are of this kind. They do not extend my knowledge. When I think of a bachelor, I think of an unmarried man. When I think of an unmarried man, I think of a bachelor. So if you tell me that a bachelor is an unmarried man, I have not learned anything new about, about bachelors. On the contrary, synthetic judgments extend my knowledge. For example, some bachelors eat spaghetti. If that's true, I have learned something new about bachelors that I cannot know by the, the, the mere definition of bachelors, okay? So Hume says, our knowledge or what we think is knowledge is based on the idea of cause and effect. But where does the idea of cause and effect come from? Remember, Hume says, ideas are either complex ideas like a golden mountain, or they are copies of impressions, okay? You see uh, a piano, you have an idea of a piano. You hear a trumpet, you have an idea of the sound of a trumpet. But ask yourself, where does this idea of cause and effect comes from? It's not a copy of an impression because when you look at two events, for example, I throw a rock into a pond and then there are ripples in the water. You never see the, the causal connection. You always see two events, two distinct events. You don't actually see the, uh, the chain, the link between the two events. Consequently, you cannot possibly acquire the idea of causation from the world. And Kant agrees with Hume. Kant says, yes, Hume was right. Causation is not in the world. But that's the mistake that, that Hume made. He was looking at causation in the world. You're not going to find it. Causation is not in the world because causation is not a process that happens in the world between uh, two objects. But causation is the form of the understanding, a form of the understanding at least. So now let's return to this thought in a, in a second. Let me read this slide. All analytical judgments depend wholly on the law of contradiction and they are in their nature a priori cognitions. Um, and synthetic judgments depend on our experience. However, Kant wants to show that Hume and Descartes as well overlooked another source of knowledge, another type of judgment that we make, okay? And that judgment is known as synthetic a priori. What is synthetic a priori? Synthetic a priori is a judgment based on pure reason. So reason, our capacity to reason, is such that uh, it has a form. And that form, that predisposition, is what imposes upon reality a certain, uh, a certain, uh, um, a certain form. Okay. Uh, let me explain it because this sounds complicated and, uh, and obscure. In other words, Kant says 
causal judgments are possible because the causal connection is a, 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 uh, an objective and universal form of our cognition that makes these judgments. That's why Hume is not going to be able to find causation in nature, because causation is required by our minds in order for us to make these, uh, these judgments of cause and effect. Um, now, for example, Hume declared that, that mathematics is just a matter of relation of ideas. In other words, mathematics is known a priori, end of the story, it's analytic. Um, but mathematical ob uh, judgments, in fact, Kant shows, are not analytic, but they are synthetic, and yet, at the same time, they have the same necessity that a priori analytic propositions have. So, all mathematical judgments are necessary, okay? And not empirical, because it cannot be proven through experience. So, the existence of mathematics establishes that some synthetic judgments can be known a priori. It's very interesting. Now, Kant gives an example, the example of 12. 7 plus 5 and 12. Now, think about it. How do you know that 7 plus 5 equals 12? You know it by definition, because when you calculate 7 plus 5, it gives you 12. However, Kant noted, 12 is by no means the same thing as 7 plus 5. Why? Because 12 could be, can be, 13 minus 1, right? Or 14 minus 2, or 6 plus 6. So 7 plus 5 and 12 are not the same thing. Consequently, the, uh, the subject, 7 plus 5, and the predicate, 12, are distinct. In other words, analytic propositions are do those propositions where uh, the, uh, the predicate term is contained in a subject term. For example, all triangles have, are three-sided figures. Now, being a three-sided figure, figure is exactly part of the definition of what it is to be a triangle. So the definition is contained inside the, uh, the subject. Or in other words, the predicate is contained, contained within the, uh, the subject of the sentence. So when I say that triangles are three-sided figures, Hey, I don't make any uh, uh, extension to my knowledge. I already know that because that's a truth established on the basis of reasoning alone or uh, based on the meaning of the terms. On the other hand, synthetic propositions, remember, extend your knowledge. If I say that bachelors like ice cream. Well, liking ice cream is not something that is part of the definition of what it is to be a bachelor. Consequently, whether it's true, if it's true that bachelors like ice cream, it's something that I have to know through experience, which will extend my knowledge of what it, what it is to be a bachelor. Now, think about, again, mathematics. If 7 plus 5 and 12 were analytic, an analytic judgment, 
if 7 plus 5 equals 12 were an analytic judgment as Hume thought, then I would know immediately that 7 plus 5 equals 12, and I would know immediately that 12 is 7 plus 5. But if I say to you 12, you by no means think about 7 plus 5. You could think of many other things. If I ask you, how do you make 12? Many different ways. And so uh, the subject, in this case, 7 plus 5, does not contain the predicate, which is 12. 7 plus 5 does not contain 12. And yet, 7 plus 5 is 12. So how do you explain this? Uh, Hume, uh, Kant explains this by saying that mathematics is not analytic, but is synthetic. In our judgment of mathematical truths is synthetic a priori. In other words, it is when it comes to uh, mathematics, mathematical truths, we know those truths by definition. We know them necessarily to be necessarily true. But at the same time, they are not analytic truths that we know by definition, by the very um, definition of the terms involved. Okay? So our concept is really amplified by the proposition 7 plus 5 equals 12. And we add to the first a second, not thought, not thought previously thought in it. So ar ar arithmetical judgments are therefore all synthetic. Now, the principles of geometry are also synthetic a priori. As demonstrated by the, uh, the statement, a straight line is the shortest path between two points. Now, you see, the, the, uh, the definition of a straight line is not that is the shortest distance between two points. And yet, it is the straight, the, 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 the shortest distance between two points. Consequently, the only way to explain this is that there is a faculty of the mind, a third faculty of the mind, the third process of learning, of knowing things. Analytic and synthetic, but the third one that Kant shows is synthetic a priori. In other words, our minds, our minds are rational, and we can acquire knowledge through uh, reason, okay? But not through reason alone, of course. We, we do need experience. But there are certain things that we know, and we know them because they are necessary. What makes it necessary? What makes it necessary is our nature. Our nature is such that we know certain things necessarily so our nature imposes necessity on the, uh, upon the world okay? by certain uh, forms. It's as if, for example, we were born with, uh, with certain, uh, um, certain tools. Certain, for example, if, if we were born with glasses, uh, but certain special kinds of glasses. One type of glasses or type of tool or uh, if you want to use the analogy of a computer, uh, software, okay? In our software, we, uh, we come by nature already with, uh, with the capacity to uh, understand temporal things. And that's what makes mathematic, mathematics possible. Because in our minds, we have an embedded uh, apparatus or form of the understanding, as Kant would put it, by virtue of which we, we uh, are able to make synthetic a priori judgments. 
okay? And also we have a software. Um, okay, what, what kind of synthetic a priori judgments? Mathematical judgments, okay? And these judgments depend on the notion of time. Time, doing mathematics and thinking itself requires time. When you think about something, it, it, time elapses. And mathematics is based on the, uh, this um, innate structure of our understanding that is temporal and gives to the world, to our experience, a temporal understanding of the world. The other one is the notion of time, a space, okay? Sorry, uh, the notion of space. And that is why geometry is synthetic a priori. Synthe uh, geometri geometrical judgments are synthetic a priori. Uh, because, again, our minds are endowed with uh, a uh, form or software which is spatial, of space. And this form of the understanding, we use it to understand the world and uh, we see the world through the, uh, the, this spatial software um, uh, predisposition, spatial predisposition to see the world in terms of space terms of measures, of points, distances, okay? How is the world out there? Kant says, I don't know. I don't know. We know the world, but we know it. We know it through uh, reasoning because our understanding, our apparatus, our brains, are made in such a way that they, uh, they already contain a, a sort of software, temporal and spatial softwares. And these uh, filter reality, <clears throat> whatever that might be, we cannot possibly know reality. Maybe there isn't a reality. Maybe reality is not space and time. But space and time are the forms of understanding the forms by which we understand the world. Okay. So Hume was correct in claiming that experience cannot provide necessity because it is provided by the understanding. Okay, so experience cannot provide necessity. Necessity is a form, is to be found in our understanding. The necessity connecting events in the world that Hume was trying to find in the world was impossible because rationality provides that connection. Rationality provides that necessity. At the same time, this argument shows that we are independent observers and there is a nature, a world out there. We cannot penetrate the world in itself, but we know, we know that there are objective representations to our cognition of the world through uh, our minds, our apparatuses. Okay, I explained this, how math is possible because we have this, uh, as I call it, software. I think Kant would agree with, uh, with my analogy of software if he knew about software. I don't know. Um, but I, it's a good analogy. And geometry. Geometry is possible because of our spatial understanding that is already in here. And this is the end of this very difficult, complicated lecture um, of Hume, Descartes, Hume, and Kant.
So the moral of the story of this lecture is an interesting uh, discussion that moves from the rationalist Descartes, who believed that human beings are rational beings. We've, we are governed by a rational order. We are rational and uh, we are not physical beings. We uh, exist as non-physical substances. And these substances relate to physical objects, our bodies. And our knowledge is possible because, first of all, we have innate ideas. And with our minds, which are created by God, uh, perhaps not as perfect as the mind of God, uh, well, not definitely, not perhaps, definitely not perfect like the minds of God, but we still have the capacity to uh, very carefully use mathematics and logic and discover truths about the world. Not through our senses, but through reasoning alone. Hume, on the other hand, shows that knowledge is an illusion. Human beings are not rational. Human beings cannot prove anything to be true in the world or about themselves. No necessity exists that can be proven, either by experience or by pure a priori reasoning. On the other hand, Immanuel Kant offers a richer, I would say, picture uh, of the world. Well, richer, but also uh, for some people, uh, like Descartes, unsatisfactory. Because Hume thought we cannot know anything about the, the universe or about ourselves. Descartes thought that we can know everything. Because Descartes was naive in the sense that he thought that with our minds we can know the world because we are independent observers and the way we perceive the world, that's the way it is. But we don't know it through our experience. We know it through our senses. Hume says, no, senses are useless. There's only experience that we have if we want to know something. And we don't even know it for certain. Kant came uh, with this idea, combined the two, and showed that it is possible to know things, but not the world in itself. We don't know what it is. We know what our minds, what our minds impose upon the world. Now, this doesn't mean, mind you, this uh, be careful, doesn't mean that Kant thinks that every individual has a different view of the world and a different reality and a different truth about the world. No, we are all equal and we all have the experience of the world. And that necessity is for all human beings. So we, while we, we don't know what the world looks like, is like in reality, if, that, if there is such a world, we do know how the world works. We do know that causality does exist, not because it's in the world, but because it's a form of our understanding. That's how we, why we make sense of the world in terms of a cause and effect. That's how we, we know mathematics. That's how mathematics is possible. And that's how geometry is possible. And that's how science is possible. Okay, well, I will end the, uh, the lecture here. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was not too confusing. You learned something out of it, and I'll see you in the next lecture.